Imagine an engine so powerful it echoed across job sites, highways, and harbors for over half a century. The Detroit Diesel 8V71 wasn't just loud, it was legendary. But behind that unmistakable scream was an engine with problems that wouldn't go away. From relentless oil leaks to heat buildup that cooked it alive, the 8V71 was worshipped by some and cursed by others. This is the story of an icon that ran hot, in every sense of the word. Some say it was overbuilt, others say it was doomed from the start. The Detroit Diesel 8V71 still stirs arguments wherever diesel heads gather. It's loud, leaky, unforgiving, and unforgettable. Over the past few months, I've heard from dozens of mechanics, truckers, veterans, and engineers who use this engine in the real world. Some swore by it, others swore at it. This engine was a marvel of engineering, but it wasn't built for every job. While rarely seen in actual tractors, its failures under the wrong conditions helped define its reputation. Let's find out why so many still argue whether the 8V71 was misunderstood or just fundamentally flawed. It's hard to overstate how revolutionary the Detroit Diesel 8V71 was when it launched in 1957. Designed by GM's Detroit Diesel division, this engine was part of the legendary Series 71 family and became one of the most iconic two-stroke diesels ever built. It featured eight cylinders in a V configuration, each with a displacement of 71 cubic inches giving it a total displacement of 568 cubic inches. The 8V71 used a two-stroke cycle, unlike the more common four-stroke diesels, which meant it produced a power stroke with every revolution of the crankshaft. To make this work, it required forced scavenging. Instead of relying on natural airflow, it used a roots-type blower to push fresh air in and expel exhaust gases. That blower was not optional, it was essential. No blower, no combustion. This engine also used wet cylinder sleeves. And yes, let's put the internet rumors to rest right now. The 8V71 does not use dry sleeves. It does not have cast-in bores. It is, without question, a wet sleeve engine. During a full rebuild, you can clearly see the liners being pulled from the block, each one sealed with O-rings that isolate coolant flow. These aren't surface inserts. They're full-length, removable sleeves that bathe in coolant. This setup wasn't just smart, it was essential. It allowed for faster heat transfer, consistent thermal regulation, and straightforward rebuilds. For anyone still in doubt, screenshots from a publicly available teardown video show this unmistakably. Instead of machining the block after cylinder wear, you simply swap in new sleeves, pistons, and rings. Done. No need for expensive boring or sleeving operations. Another standout feature was the unit injector system, mechanically actuated by the camshaft. Each cylinder had its own self-contained injector, which simplified the fuel system and eliminated the need for a high-pressure rail. It was a rugged setup that was easier to service in the field, but it required precise tuning. When these injectors wore down or lost calibration, Misfires or fuel starvation could cause major performance loss. The 8V71 also featured a modular cylinder head design. Not one head per cylinder, but one per bank of four cylinders. This made some repairs faster, but it also meant that removing the head required servicing multiple cylinders at once, which could add time and complexity to certain jobs. In fact, the 8V71 was designed with rapid service in mind. According to former Greyhound operators and mechanics, entire engines could be dropped from the cradle and swapped in as little as 45 minutes. The engine's layout was built to be modular, clean, and self-contained, not just for maintenance, but for fleet uptime. Some shops had dyno-ready replacements staged and ready to install while the old engine was rolled out for rebuild. The lubrication system was another highlight. Gear-driven oil pumps pushed oil through filters and coolers to keep the internals lubricated and cooled. But a clogged filter or failed relief valve could quickly choke oil flow and send temperatures soaring. Pressure relief valves were a common failure point in the field. If stuck open, they could lead to dangerously low oil pressure. 
Bypass valves were often overlooked during maintenance, and while they didn't typically cause pressure loss, a malfunction could mean unfiltered oil was circulating, posing a different kind of long-term risk. Cooling was no less important. Coolant flowed through the block, heads, and oil cooler. In marine applications, fresh or seawater systems powered by external pumps kept temperatures down. Without frequent flushing and cleaning, scale buildup in coolant passages could lead to hot spots, warping, and catastrophic failure. Compression ratios were tight, 17 to 1 on standard models and 18.7 to 1 on N-series versions. Main bearing cap bolts were torqued between 165 and 175 pound-feet, and liner to block clearances ranged from 1.5 thousandths of an inch when new to a 2.5 thousandths wear limit. These weren't forgiving tolerances. They demanded precision and discipline in maintenance. The electrical system rounded out the package with rugged starters, alternators, and relays built to handle cold starts and long-duty cycles. These components were especially important in northern climates, where operators frequently praised the 8V71 as one of the rare diesels that could reliably start in freezing weather without needing excessive cranking or ether. Simplicity and durability were consistent across every system. It was durable, powerful for its size, and designed to run flat out at high RPM. Later versions were available with turbochargers, which increased power and efficiency by improving airflow into the blower. But they did not replace the blower or directly handle scavenging themselves. Even turbocharged 8V71s still relied on the roots blower for scavenging. That function is critical to the two-stroke cycle. The turbo acted more as a pre-compressor, feeding higher pressure air to the blower to enhance volumetric efficiency. These turbo models required different tuning, often had upgraded injectors, and were sometimes paired with aftercoolers, giving them a distinct performance envelope from their naturally aspirated counterparts. But, as we'll see, that design philosophy came with trade-offs. If you've ever heard an 8V71 at full throttle, you already know where the nickname comes from. Known as the Screamin' Jimmy, this engine didn't just run, it roared. With a redline often set between 2100 and 2300 RPM, it was one of the few diesels of its time that sounded more like a turbine than a tractor. That howl came from the combined mechanical symphony of its two-stroke cycle, roots blower, and high-speed valve train, all moving at blistering speed compared to traditional four-strokes. But the nickname wasn't just about volume, it was also about personality. The 8V71 was compact for its power output and loved to be revved, while many diesels thrived on grunt and low-end torque. The Jimmy came alive at the top end. That made it a favorite for operators who valued responsiveness and punch, especially in fire engines, transit buses, and boats where throttle changes were constant. Its modular, field-serviceable design only added to its reputation. Mechanics could swap out heads, injectors, or even entire cylinder kits on site with relatively simple tools. And in turbocharged variants, the increased airflow made the scream even sharper, turning heads and splitting ears at every throttle pull. Besides, but that's a Detroit for you. Come on, Katie! It was an engine that made no apologies for being loud, proud, and mechanically aggressive. In an era of slow, thumping diesels, the Screamin' Jimmy was a mechanical rebel, and everyone knew when one was coming. For all its innovation and personality, the 8V71 was far from flawless, and in the wrong setting it could be outright fragile. One of its biggest limitations was its inability to handle lugging or idle-heavy conditions. Unlike modern engines that produce high torque at low RPMs, the 8V71 was designed to run at consistent high RPMs. Drop the revs too low, and it would lose scavenging efficiency, build heat rapidly, and risk serious internal damage. Many operators learned this the hard way. 
The 8V71 thrived in trucks cruising down the highway or boats running full throttle. But when placed in tractors, skid steers, or other stop-and-go equipment, it would overheat, foul its injectors, or even crack its heads. That wasn't a design flaw, it was a mismatch of application. Oil leaks were another notorious issue. One popular saying went, you didn't change the oil, you just kept adding it. Valve cover gaskets, blower seals, and airbox drains often weeped or outright sprayed oil after only moderate wear. While not catastrophic, it created dirty engine bays, environmental messes, and frequent top-offs. Another Achilles heel was heat management. Poor maintenance, like ignoring clogged coolant passages or failed thermostats, often led to warped heads and scorched pistons. The two-stroke design created more heat per revolution than a comparable four-stroke, and when airflow or cooling faltered, it didn't take long for damage to set in. In the field, common problems included valve cover leaks, blown liners, and excess crankcase pressure. When liners wore unevenly or rings failed, blow-by would build up in the crankcase, stressing seals and fouling filters. Mechanics often faced these issues in fleets that skimped on preventative maintenance. What compounded all of this was that the 8V71 was often installed in equipment it was never meant to power. In farming applications especially, where engines idle, lug, and run under varying loads, it failed quickly. These misuses gave it a reputation for unreliability in circles that never saw the engine used as it was intended. Even its sound, iconic as it was, you know, became a liability in some industries. Long-haul drivers loved it. Municipal fleet managers, not so much. Sound fatigue, vibration, and complaints from operators meant that by the 1980s, many organizations phased out the screaming jimmy in favor of quieter, more flexible engines. This wasn't an engine for everyone, and if you didn't understand how to run it, maintain it, and match it to the right task, it would punish you for it. Because it excelled in settings where consistent output and reliability were non-negotiable, the 8V71 found its glory in the environments it was designed for. At sea level, under load, and turning high RPMs all day, the engine was nearly unstoppable. It thrived in settings where consistent performance mattered more than flexibility. One of its most successful homes was in marine service. Coast Guard vessels, Navy Seabees equipment, commercial tugs and fishing boats all made excellent use of the 8V71's flat power band and durability. In maritime settings where engines run for hours or days at a fixed RPM, the 8V71 was efficient, easy to service, and practically indestructible. In the world of public transit, it became the heart of Greyhound and city buses throughout North America. Drivers loved the instant throttle response. Mechanics appreciated how accessible the modular components were. The two-stroke scream wasn't just a sound, it was a presence. For many, it signaled dependability and forward motion. Fire engines also capitalized on the 8V71's fast revving character. The ability to launch quickly, maintain high RPMs, and produce strong continuous output made it ideal for emergency service vehicles, especially in urban environments with short sprints between stops. Stationary generators were another niche where the engine thrived. Hospitals, factories, and construction sites use them as backup or even primary power sources. These gensets could run for weeks at a time without needing to shut down, a testament to the engine's design for longevity and high load endurance. In the military, the 8V71 was commonly found in landing craft and various field support equipment. Its field serviceable design made it a favorite in combat zones and remote bases. A team of mechanics could swap heads or injectors without pulling the engine, and if things got really bad, a spare unit could be craned in quickly thanks to the cradle system. And let's not forget over-the-road trucking. In the 1960s and 70s, countless long-haul drivers swore by the 8V71. With careful tuning and strong gearing, 
these engines pulled their weight across the country. When they were healthy and matched to the right transmission, they could chew through miles and mountains with ease. Even today, you'll still find the 8V71 in custom repowers and tractor pulls, where high horsepower, mechanical control, and that unmistakable scream make it a fan favorite. In off-road machines, vintage trucks, and show builds, gearheads still choose the 8V71 not just for its power, but for the character that only an analog beast can deliver. By the early 1990s, the writing was on the wall for this engine, and for two-stroke diesels in general. The engine simply couldn't meet tightening emissions regulations. By the early 1990s, the Environmental Protection Agency began enforcing stricter emission standards, including Tier 1 requirements that phased in starting in 1996. These standards targeted nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, and hydrocarbons. Areas where older two-stroke engines like the 8V71 fell short without massive re-engineering. Its design, built for mechanical efficiency and field serviceability, was fundamentally at odds with the electronic controls, emissions after treatment systems, and real-time monitoring required by the new rules. It lacked the ability to support closed-loop emissions control, had no capacity for exhaust gas recirculation, and couldn't accommodate the diesel particulate filters or NOx after-treatment systems, mandated in later tier standards. Retrofitting a two-stroke with that kind of tech wasn't just impractical, and it was nearly impossible. For fleets, governments, and manufacturers, it was easier to retire the engine than re-engineer it. But as the engine disappeared from new builds, its reputation began to splinter. And if there's one complaint that spanned nearly every application, buses, boats, trucks, or tractors, it was the oil leaks. These engines were famous for marking their territory. Blower seals, airbox drains, and valve cover gaskets were all repeat offenders. Even engines in otherwise good condition would often seep oil, staining everything nearby. It wasn't always a mechanical failure. In many cases, it was just how they aged. To veterans who'd run them hard and maintained them right, the 8V71 was a legend. But to younger operators, might you, or to those who inherited poorly maintained examples, it seemed like a leaky, loud, outdated relic. And many of its biggest failures weren't due to flaws in the design, but flaws in how it was used. One of the most persistent myths is that the 8V71 used dry sleeves. It didn't. The engine was a wet sleeve design from the beginning, a fact visible in every rebuild and confirmed by technical manuals and teardown videos. Another myth, that the turbocharged versions solved all its problems. In reality, while they boosted power and efficiency, Turbo 8V71s still required high RPM and suffered if treated like low-speed torque monsters. People also tend to speak of the 8V71 as if it was a single, consistent product. But the reality is more complex. There were naturally aspirated and turbocharged models, marine and land-based variants, different injector ratings, compression ratios, and tuning profiles. Not all 8V71s behaved the same, and generalizing leads to confusion. What killed the 8V71 wasn't one big flaw. It was a shifting world, one that moved toward cleaner air, quieter streets, and engines that could communicate with computers. The 8V71 had none of that. It was a product of its time. And when the world changed, it didn't. But here's what people get wrong, thinking that its end means it wasn't great. It was. In the right application, with the right crew, the 8V71 was one of the most effective and beloved diesel engines ever built. It just didn't belong everywhere, and it never pretended to. Today, the 8V71 survives in collector circles, repowered customs, and as a cultural relic from diesel's golden age. It's a reminder that engineering success doesn't always mean universal success. It means excelling in the role you were built for. The 8V71 did just that for nearly four decades. And for those who worked with it, the sound of a screaming Jimmy isn't just noise, it's nostalgia.